For interviews on educational technology and for a list of our educational technology workshops, please visit www.edtechlive.com. And for discounted Dell computers, please visit our sponsor, www.k12computers.com. Thinking about my background, I mean, I taught myself to program at kind of age 11 and kind of knew from that point that this is what I wanted to do, you know, as a, as a career. And, um, you know, the idea that a kid today who's 11 is going to be able to discover and participate in this whole world uh, where they're going to be able to, you know, they're interested in computers, they're going to have the source code of their operating system, they're going to know how it works. They're going to have the source code to their development tools, they're going to have the source code to their browser, they're going to have the source code to their word processor, to everything that they do. Um, th that level of exposure, um, to have that in every classroom and have every kid who's interested in computers and technology and software be able to learn about how this stuff works and actually participate in it. I think that's super exciting. We have never had a medium before ever where anybody can contribute. Um, where anybody can go um, into that medium and can contribute. You couldn't, you know, you, you and I, we couldn't produce our own newspapers, or you know, if we did, we couldn't get them to any readers. We couldn't produce our own magazines. We couldn't produce our own TV shows. We couldn't produce our own radio programs. We couldn't produce our own, you know, books. I mean, you know, and on the Internet, everybody can contribute, and everybody can contribute anything. And, you know, it's not just print. Um, it's also video, and it's music, and it's audio, and it's all kinds of things. That's just that's just huge. We're just now, one of the fun things about this industry is we're just now starting to really see the potential of what exists, and we're only now starting to figure out how a lot of this, you know, a lot of these, a lot of, the, a lot of how this ability to contribute is going to get used broadly, and I think 10 years from now, I think it's just going to be staggering uh, and how many people in the world are going to be hooked up and contributing, not just consuming. So we think social networking is a framework, um, especially for the new generation of Internet users, but also for everybody else on the Internet. It's a, it's a framework or a metaphor through which self-expression and communication are going to happen more and more online. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon. Welcome to EdTech Live. Today is Thursday, May 24th, and my guest is Mark Andresen. Mark, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, delighted to be here. Mark, would you tell our listening audience, which is mostly going to be educators, uh, could you give them a brief background uh, of your history and um, and, the, and your association with uh, the browser? Sure. So uh, my background, so starting at the beginning briefly, is uh, I uh, went to a public school in a very small town in, uh, in Wisconsin for uh, K-12, through uh, and then went to the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign um, for... Um, for my undergraduate, I uh, got my undergraduate degree in computer science. Um, and, and at Illinois, I was fortunate enough to um, be involved with a uh, institute at the university called the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which uh, this was in the uh, sort of early, very early 90s, 91, 92, 93. Um, and NCSA, as it was called, was one of, at the time was one of the four federally funded, um, NSF funded supercomputing centers. Um, so they would basically buy big supercomputers like craze and um, and uh, twenty five million dollar machines and so we put them in four locations including Illinois and then scientists and researchers from uh, all over the country would be able to use them over what was then the NSF net which of course became became the internet as we know it today um, and so at NCSA one of the things that we did was uh, we had a, a software development group that was building software tools that would make it easy for researchers to actually use these supercomputers and by extension use the internet the the young sort of brand new internet. Um, and uh, one of the software tools uh, that we built uh, was uh, was Mosaic, which was a uh, basically a small sort of Scuffworks project um, that a friend of mine and I did uh, in 92 uh, and then in 93 um, to basically build a, you know, at the time, to build a super usable, super friendly, um, you know, easy to use graphical uh, browser um, uh, for um, what was at that point the very early web as well as the other uh, protocols and, and, um, and uh, techniques that people were using on the internet at that point, like FT things like FTP and Gopher uh, and Waste and other things that have, uh, are, um, are are not quite as broadly used anymore. Um, and of course, the web part of it is what is what really uh, is what really took off. So um, Mosaic uh, kind of took off from there. Um, and then later, uh, I graduated in uh, early year in uh, December '93, and then uh, most of the team and I uh, formed uh, the company Netscape uh, with Jim Clark, who was a longtime Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Um, and then at Netscape, we had a second opportunity to build a browser, so we built a better browser, uh, Netscape Navigator, um, and then uh, that kind of uh, that kind of took off from there. So when did uh, when did Netscape uh, and the browser move toward being open source? 
Yeah, really good, really good question. So the um, there was always a very deep, rich sort of open source heritage to everything that that, that we did and everything that was going on. So um, Mosaic itself was essentially open source. Um, it had a little bit of an unusual license for a, an open source project. Um, because you know, things were still getting tried at, at that point in terms of what worked and what didn't, but the source code was available and people were able to do all kinds of things with it. Um, and we had a very active, sort of very small but very active uh, development community around it. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that that was that. Then at Netscape, we, you know, we started a sort of a commercial software company, and so we didn't start out doing uh, a lot of open source software specifically as a business. Um, but um, you know all of the formats and protocols and a lot of the surrounding technology, HTTP and HTML and and the Apache, you know the, the Apache web server. The Apache web server actually comes from uh, a, a project, uh, a parallel project with Mosaic that we had at, at Illinois called the MCSA uh, web server, which became uh, the Apache web server. Um, you know there was just and then scripting languages like Perl were very commonly used with the web. So there was a lot of open source sort of around what Netscape was doing. Um, Netscape Navigator itself was not open source for the first three or four years. Um, it was freely available for nonprofit and academic and education use as a binary. Um, so it was very you know easy for people to download and use. It just we didn't make it open source until I think probably '98 or so, um, and then we made it open source, which eventually became the Mozilla Project. Uh, which eventually became the Mozilla Foundation, which eventually became uh, Firefox um, and Thunderbird and Camino and all of the other uh, uh, very exciting projects that are going on in that world right now. So you can kind of trace, a, you know, you kind of trace a direct line from sort of writing Mosaic open source in '92 all the way through to Firefox as it exists today. In in the '90s, were you calling it open source? What were you calling it? So open source is yeah, actually a really really interesting uh, question. Um, it was primarily the term primarily used um, for uh, open source up until I think it was what ninety seven or ninety eight was would have been I think free software um, and that was you know the term that Richard Richard Stallman always used um, and uh, with the GNU project um, and so I think we would have called it free software or public domain um, so there were basically two models for open source up to that point I think that were widespread. One was some people would just put their stuff basically under a public domain license. And so, the, for example, Berkeley, uh, the famous BSD Unix distribution that Bill Joy uh, created uh, in the 70s, I think, um, was out under basically essentially a public domain license, the so-called Berkeley license, which basically was public domain, except you couldn't take credit for creating it. You had to give Berkeley the sort of recognition that they deserved. Um, and then there was Richard Stallman's effort, uh, the GNU project, and the Free Software Foundation, which was the GNU public license, which at the time was a very, you know, I still remember when that was something that very, very few people knew about, and it's 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 so cool to see that as a sort of a broad topic of conversation in the legal community and in the in the software world, uh, that his his ideas have become so widely understood now. Because um, at the time, I mean, it was, you know, if you talk to anybody who knew anything about copyright, he was considered a lunatic in, in the early 90s, and now he's considered a genius and, you know, was way ahead of his time uh, in the issues that really matter. Um, so, you know, those were the two models. The term open source really hadn't gotten any traction, hadn't been originated. I believe Eric Raymond originated it in the, in the mid to late 90s, and it, it, it got traction very fast. And it was very cool how it got traction very fast because it zeroed in on the issue of source code access, which which had always been the heart of Richard Stallman's argument, but by calling it free software, that caused people to focus on the economics of what it cost. And this is the whole thing is, what is it, uh, free as in beer? I forget the other part of the analogy, but free as in beer versus free as in... Free speech. I don't know, free speech, exactly, free as in speech. I was about to say free love. I'm glad you got in front of me on that one. <laughs> Um, free as in uh, free as in free, free as in beers and free as in speech. The problem with calling it free software is you had to explain the difference between basically free in dollar terms versus free in speech terms. The advantage of calling it open source is it it's, it gets to what really matters, which is access to the source code. Um, and so the, that term, this is something I, that I drew a really important lesson from, is is crystallization of that term crystallized the idea. And once that happened, then all of a sudden, all kinds of people said, "Oh, that's what this is about." Um, and you know, Stallman had been out for 15, 20 years pushing this idea, but giving it the term caused a lot of other people to be able to understand it, and that really catalyzed the whole thing. You know, I interviewed both uh, Richard and Eric Raymond, and and I would characterize Richard as uncompromising. Exactly. Um, it was very hard to even get the interview with him, and he was very determined that it happened under certain circumstances, and we only referred to the software in certain ways. Um, and I really appreciate the voice that he's been. At the same time, I think you've recognized that it was, very, it was very hard to get traction with that kind of an uncompromising stance. 
he was incredibly important. He was, you know, the, the founding father of a lot of this stuff. And it's, it's, you're right. And he's been uncompromising from the start. And it's, it's a, it's a form of being uncompromising that comes from being incredibly smart and incredibly visionary and having a very concrete idea of how you think the world should be. And basically, you know, he's poured 30, 40 years of his life into pursuing that sort of singular vision. And it's, it's now happening in, in so many ways. And of course, you know, real life being the way that it is, it's happening in a far more messy way than he ever imagined or wanted. Um, but it's happening at such a larger scale um, than I think that I, he may have envisioned that it would ultimately happen at this level of scale um, with hundreds of millions of people using open source software or free software um, it, with something like, you know, Linux and the GNU project and <laughs> it's called Linux or GNU Linux or, or whatever and, and, you know, all these Firefox and all these things happening at, at just uh, sort of this, this huge scale. He may have imagined that, um, but I don't think very many other people did. And the fact that he was always so clear and so vivid you know, even when he was polarizing and even when he was alienating, um, you know, to certain people, you know, the, the idea came across so strongly um, and it, you know, motivated, you know, so many other people to think about it. And it's one of the interesting things about somebody with that strong of a vision is even when people disagree with them, it, the disagreement itself can lead to positive outcome because it leads to exploration of all kinds of ideas that maybe people wouldn't have even thought to explore if they hadn't had sort of a foil to be able to operate against. So. Um, I, I think he just deserves huge credit. I think he's, you know, gets a huge amount of the responsibility for everything that's happening. You know, he was way out in front on all this stuff, and, and I mean, you just you can't argue with his level of commitment, his level of dedication. I mean, huge swaths of what we now know as Linux or, or GNU Linux, you know, were, he actually wrote, you know, by hand. Um, you know, he put years and years and years and years into this. So it's, I, for me, he, he may not agree with this, but I'm very excited for him that that, that so much of his vision has, has has taken hold and has taken hold at such a large scope, even if he doesn't fully agree with how some of it has played out. So I would agree, and I have a similar level of respect, although you have a, a deeper understanding of all of the issues involved. One of the things I've appreciated about uh, Richard and the free and open source software movement is that it does have the uh, history of coming out of the education environment. And, and I've been waiting for uh, free and open source software to have more of an impact on education because of that. And I think it's beginning to happen. Uh, have you thought at all about the implications for uh, free and open source software in schools? I would say, I, I guess I would categorize, I would categorize sort of the, the impact of the potential impact in, 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 in two dimensions. I would say one dimension is, um, which is super exciting, is, is the ability for schools to be able to use open source software as a way to give their students more sophisticated computing tools, communication tools. In the, in the general pursuit of education. So, you know, Linux in the classroom, the ability to, you know, for example, take older PCs and repurpose them and have every kid be able to have access, you know, to, to, you know, to the Internet and to be able to, you know, really bring the price down on this stuff and to have, you know, Linux, you know, be a more stable environment than perhaps some of the commercial alternatives. Uh, and all the other sort of implications of that, um, uh, particularly in, under the, you know, sort of economic constraints that a lot of, uh, a lot of teachers operate under and a lot of school districts operate under. Um, I would say that's one dimension and very exciting, and I think that's a dimension that's hitting critical mass. It's, it's easier to see that happening going forward than it, than it has been in the past because so much open source software now is getting packaged and, if you will, productized in a form where it actually is easy to install, it's easy to use, it doesn't break. It's, you know, it's, you know, Firefox is at a level of quality that's comparable or superior to any, any uh, commercial product, and, you know, that <laughs> was not always true with open source in the past. Um, and then I think the other side of the dimension is um, specifically for students, kids to be able to actually get access to the source code uh, and be able to understand how technology works and be able to actually directly participate in the creation um, of technology. Um, you know, as somebody, you know, just thinking about my background, I mean, I taught myself to program at kind of age 11 and kind of knew from that point that this is what I wanted to do, you know, as a, as a career. And, um, you know, the idea that a kid today who's 11 is going to be able to discover and participate in this whole world uh, where they're going to be able to, you know, they're interested in computers, they're going to have the source code to their operating system. They're going to know how it works. They're going to have the source code to their development tools. They're going to have the source code to their browser. They're going to have the source code to their word processor, to everything that they do. Um, that, that level of exposure, um, you know, that's, that's sort of Richard Stallman's vision extrapolated way out, you know, because he first ran into that as a, as a uh, P, I believe, a PhD candidate at, uh, at MIT in the 70s, where they had that kind of ethic in the computer science department there. To have that in every classroom and have every kid who's interested in computers and technology and software be able to learn about how this stuff works and actually participate in it, I think that's super exciting. It doesn't 
translate to every kid. I mean, you know, kids who are <laughs> so interested in computers, I don't know that, yeah, that that part of it is that relevant to them. But, but for kids who are, or math, or science, or engineering, um, you know, it's, 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 it's just amazing. And it's a level of access to technology um, that, um, and, a, and a way to engage in technology in a sort of fully democratized form where even, you know, an 11-year-old in, you know, rural Kansas or an 11-year-old in Vietnam or an 11-year-old in you know, remote areas of China or India or, you know, who knows, you know, with their parents at an Antarctic research station, I suppose. Mark, your vision for students learning to program early is really compelling. Uh, there's a change that I've heard you talk about related to programming that I think will likely make this even more exciting. Can I ask you to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I think that um, I think that the world of programming is 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 changing a lot, and is changing is changing in a way that it become a very different thing that it's been in the past. And what I mean by that is to really understand the history of programming, basically from the original invention of the computer in sort of the early 50s through to about the mid-90s, uh, so sort of for the first 40 or 45 years. As a programmer, the thing that you were always most concerned about um, writing any kind of software was in, in, in working around or dealing with the limitations of the hardware that you had. So computers were, you know, for, for people who programmed in those, in those decades, computers were never fast enough to do what you wanted to do. Um, you always had, you know, the CPUs were too slow. You never had very much memory. You never had very much storage space. Um, and so a lot of the art and craft of programming um, related to how to squeeze the most out of limited hardware resources. And that's why up until the mid-late 90s, the dominant programming language in the computer industry was still C and, and C++, um, was because um, you needed to have direct access to memory. You needed to be able to really go down to the, almost the level of, of the hardware itself to be able to actually optimize your programs to be able to run on what we're in essence, the slow, early, early computers. Um, starting about the mid to late 90s, um, when um, you know new generations of, of Pentium microprocessors started to come out, um, uh, really from Intel and then comparable processors from other companies, um, processors started to get fast enough um, to do a lot of things comfortably. Um, they just the processors started to get fast. Computers started to get more memory. Hard disks started to get a lot bigger. And it, was, it, was, it wasn't just the usual year by year everything gets better. It was a qualitative change. And the way to think about it is, you know, today a modern you know, laptop, I've got a MacBook sitting in front of me, and it's got a you know, 2 gigahertz processor with you know, 3 gigabytes of RAM and 160 gigabytes of storage. And from a practical standpoint, I can do almost anything on that computer um, uh, that you could do on a mainframe 20 years ago or a supercomputer 10 years ago. I can do you know, basically practically anything except for a very small category of, of applications. Um, and so what's happened is you know, with these extremely powerful computers we have now, programming is changing to, instead of focusing on hardware limitations, it's changing to focus on programmer productivity. It's changing to focus on the human element. And uh, it's basically the, the new generation of tools and technologies that are coming out of the software world, the common theme is to make it easier and easier and easier for humans um, to, to build software. So 
you uh, saw this with the shift from C to Java, and now you see it from the shift um, that's happening in the programming world from um, Java to languages like PHP and Perl and Ruby and Python. Uh, and in the Microsoft world, the shift from C to C Sharp, and now the shift to Visual Basic and Active Server Pages. Um, the new programming approaches, the new programming languages and tools are, are, are all much easier to use by an individual programmer. They let individual programmers build a lot more software in, in a much shorter period of time. Um, and that's just getting better and better and better. And of course, computers keep getting faster and better at the same time, so everything's improving. Um, but the software tools are going to keep getting better, better and easier to use. And what it, what it does is it empowers the individual programmer to be able to create a lot more software, but it also really lowers the, the bar to be a programmer. You don't have to be as much of an expert on computer hardware as you used to have to be. Um, you don't have to have as much background. You can get into it a lot faster. And I think it's a super exciting time uh, in, the, in the industry because of that. So what you've described almost sounds as though it's sort of setting the stage for something of a renaissance in computer programming. Do you think that's likely to happen? Yeah, well, I, I think so. I think that's, that's, that's definitely true. Um, and I think you see that on the web today. I think the fact that so many people are able to program on the web, so many people are able to set up their own websites. I mean, think about it this way. When somebody customizes their MySpace page by embedding a YouTube video, they're doing a very high-level form of programming. Um, when they go on um, Ning, for example, and they customize their social network, they're doing a high-level form of, of programming. When they trick out their HTML or their CSS, um, or they uh, use a, uh, you know, they, they do any of the setup of photo slideshow, whatever, you know, it, you you are able to, you know, at a very, very, very high level, um, directly manipulate. Essentially, you're directly manipulating code. You're you're actually you're actually coding. And it's just, you know, much, much, much easier than it used to be. I think the, you know, the, the metaphor in the old days would be that, you know, like 20 years ago, you would think about the equivalent being, you know, using Lotus 1, 2, 3 macros or Excel macros. And, and it's basically the, the whole whole sort of programming environment is getting just, just easier and easier and better to use um, so that more people can do that kind of sort of direct manipulation uh, of the systems that they're dealing with. And, you know, it's one of those things where it, it you know, this, this, this shift in, in programming tools and technologies, I think, has been happening for about 10 years. You know, the introduction of Java was a very big part of it so back in 95 and 96. Um, and you know it's been about 10, 12 years since then, um, and you know, but it, it's an incremental. You know, it's, it's it's happening in real time, and you know, kids who teach themselves to program today that are 12 or 14 or 16 are probably teaching themselves Ruby, or they're teaching themselves you know Python, or they're teaching themselves Perl or PHP, um, and it's just this kind of or you know Flash or HTML or CSS. You know, it's just kind of happening, you know, for really millions or tens of millions of uh, of people, kind of happening a little bit under the covers, if you will, and it's not being broadly written about or talked about, but it's happening, and I think it's going to have really, really positive long-term consequences. So you talked about being 11 years old and deciding you wanted that you knew you wanted to do programming at, yep. at that early age. So I'm imagining all of these kids who were tinkering, as John C. D. Brown called it, and deciding yep. that they want to play a part in building whatever comes next. Yes. And they, and they can. I mean, you know, I, I taught myself to program out of a book. Uh, then I got my first computer, and you know, but it's a standalone computer, a standalone, uh, you know, so small uh, a PC, you know, not connected to a network. And so I basically, the sum total of the information I had for what I could do on the computer was, um, you know, the information in that book, <laughs> and then whatever I could do on that computer, um, and then I couldn't share it with anybody. Um, so um, you know, you had to be really curious to want to do that in the early '80s. You know, these days kids get introduced to programming because they're on the web uh, and they're on a social network and they're on instant messaging and they're on, you know, they're on uh, file sharing networks and they're on all these things uh, where they're able to manipulate the code. And they're able to do new things. They're able to create very easily. They're able to share their creations with their friends, whether that, you know, whether that creation is a new HTML page or whether it's a new CSS web design or whether it's a new Java program or whether it's a new PHP program or, you know, anything, a new video that they've put together. They're able to share it instantaneously. Um, they're able to learn from one another. Um, you know, another really important thing for programming is everybody in the world now has access to all the information you could conceivably ever need to, be, to, to become a great programmer. It's, it's all online, um, all the documentation, all the manuals, all the information, resources, forums, and anybody can plug into that at any point in time for free. Um, so the information is spreading much more rapidly than it ever was before. Um, it's just it's across the board. And then, you know, another cool cool thing, and it's not directly related to education, but a thing that spins out of it that's very relevant to the developing world is you can learn how to program, and then you can actually make money by doing it um, because you can go on sites like rent coder or, or Guru or Elance, and you can actually put your services up for bid, and you can actually bid on programming jobs from, you know, American companies, um, and you can actually make money that way. Um, and so it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, for people who are interested in this kind of thing, it's just incredibly liberating what they're able to do now versus what they could do 10 or 20 years ago. 
So I think it was uh, Tim O'Reilly who said that open source was just part of a larger movement being facilitated by the um, communication enabled by the, the Internet. Um, do, do you see Web 2.0 or the Read Write Web as being a significant moment in history? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I think my sort of reading of history is that the ability to communicate is, is sort of critical to human advancement. I mean, you, you, you know, it, it's not an accident that really, really significant changes in, in, in how things work in kind of human society and how fast economies can develop and how standards of living can improve, you know, tend to be, have been in the past correlated with changes in, in communication technology. So, you know, the printing press uh, opening up uh, the ability to disseminate inf information, you know, to a much broader group of people. I mean, before the printing press, you know, basically organized religion um, was the only way, you know, basically monks transcribing documents by hand was how information could get spread. Um, you know, other than that, it was just, it was all purely oral. Um, you know, the printing press came along. It's not an accident that the Bible was the first book printed on the printing press because that was the only books that existed at that point in time were these handwritten uh, religious uh, manuscripts uh, being uh, uh, being transcribed by monks. So the you know first thing they did was they automated the production of the Bible, but then you know they automated then the production of all kinds of other books, and then you know and then ultimately later the telegraph, and then the telephone, and then television, and then you know now the internet. Um, and every time you've got this big breakthrough in, in communication technology, you give people new ways to interact. You give people new ways to um, to provide goods and services to markets. You give people new ways to learn, um, and and uh, you know, and things evolve and things get better. Um, and the you know, in the last 500 years in the West, the standard of living has generally increased at a very rapid pace. I think driven by this this sort of improvement in communication technology, um, and. You know, this is another just a huge step forward. We, we have never had a medium before, ever, where anybody can contribute, um, where anybody can go um, into that medium and can contribute. You couldn't, you know, you, you and I, we couldn't produce our own newspapers, or you know, if we did, we couldn't get them to any readers. We couldn't produce our own magazines. We couldn't produce our own TV shows. We couldn't produce our own radio programs. We couldn't produce our own, you know, books. I mean, you know, it's only a small number of people get to write books, and an even smaller number of people get to have them published um, and actually have anybody else read them. And on the internet, everybody can contribute, and everybody can contribute anything. And you know, it's not just print; um, it's also video, and it's music, and it's audio, and it's all kinds of things. Um, spoken word; it's it's going to be you know, uh, code, um, documents, research, um, and that's just that's just huge. We're just now one of the fun things about this industry is we're just now starting to really see the potential of what exists, and we're only now starting to figure out how a lot of this you know a lot of these. A lot, of the, a lot of how this ability to contribute is going to get used broadly, and I think 10 years from now, I think it's just going to be staggering uh, and how many people in the world are going to be hooked up and contributing, not just consuming. I think your description of how exciting it is to, to be able to contribute, to me, uh, helps me to understand the phenomenon of blogging. Mm -hmm. and, and I love to blog and, and, uh, uh, and, and really enjoy the medium, but I consider it something a little bit awkward. I think I told you before, I feel like it's sort of like walking on stilts. It's hard enough to do that not everyone's going to do it, but it's very exciting. There are 120,000 new blogs every day, but there are 375,000 new MySpace members every day. So there's something going on with social networking. Do you want to take a minute and talk about Ning and what you're doing there? Yeah, so we think social networking is a framework, um, especially for the new generation of Internet users, but also for everybody else on the Internet. It's a, it's a framework or a metaphor through which self-expression and communication are going to happen more and more online. So um, it's basically a, a, an organizing principle or metaphor, and, and I, I think it's very it's very fluid. You know, the definition of social networking today, um, you know, that most people know is they go on MySpace, they go on Facebook, and they see, oh, although Facebook won't actually let you use the term. If you're a partner of theirs legally, they, they prohibit you from using the term social network. But I'll, I'll go ahead and use it. But anyway, um, MySpace and Facebook are social networks in the sense that people have personal profiles and then they link back and forth to other people's personal profiles. Um, you know, at Ning, we're trying to extend that concept to make it much more broad, to make it basically, you know, in a nutshell, build your own social network for anything. But then within that social network, have all kinds of functionality combined together. So videos and photos and music and blogs and discussion forums and real-time communication and chat and, and all kinds of functions and, and then all kinds of customization. Um, so I think what's going to happen, our bet in the next five years is that blogging and social networking are going to basically converge or slam together. And so basically a very large number of people will be on social networks of one kind or another, either large ones or small ones, general ones or specialty ones, or both. 
Um, and then within the context of those social networks or using those social networks as a platform, they will then be expressing themselves and, and communicating. And one of that form, one form of that expression will, will be blogging. And we actually have blogging built into Ning, so anybody who has a Ning account or is on a, Ning, a social network running on Ning is able to have a blog. Um, blogging will be one form. You know, uh, real-time um, uh, messaging uh, will be another form. You know, uh, the ISTA messaging, SMS will be another form of communication or self-expression. Uh, there will be new metaphors, Twitter, um, with uh, this new service, Twitter, which is basically microblogging. It's kind of a cross between blogging and SMS um, on mobile phones. Um, you know, will be another kind of metaphor. Um, videos, photos, music will play a very important role. Discussions, um, and I'm sure you know things, metaphors that we haven't thought of yet. And I think one of the things that's really, really cool about the internet is that because the internet's entirely based on software, you know, there can be all kinds of experiments for new mechanisms to make it easy for people to communicate and express themselves. So, you know, blogging making the definition of what blogging is may continue to expand. You know, we may look at blogging in five years and we may be surprised that it's mostly done by video. Uh, or we may look at blogging in five years and be surprised that it's mostly done by people on mobile phones. You know, or maybe blogging will still be blogging as we understand it today, but people will be doing something else on mobile phones that's a different form of expression, uh, like Twitter, for example. Um, and so we're going to, you know, we're, we're in a sort of a cycle of innovation right now where um, a lot of these ideas are going to get tried out, um, and um, we're going to, uh, you know, see which ones get, get very broad mass appeal. But people are going to have more and more options on how they want to communicate and how they want to form together and how they want to self-organize and how they want to contribute. So I was so proud that we had a thousand members today on our Classroom 2.0 social network, but I understand that that's not even close to the top of what you're seeing. What what, what kinds of groups are forming? Yeah, so we're seeing it. So in Ning, yeah. So the so the basic principle of Ning is create your own social network for anything. And and people ask us, you know, well, is that um, you know when we go out to raise money or talk to investors or analysts or whatever, people say, well. You know, is that are they, are they small networks? Are they big networks? Are they young people? Are they old people? Are they you know people in the U.S.? Are they people overseas? And it's a really, really broad cross section. Um, the answer to all those questions is both. Um, we're seeing kind of across the board. We're seeing a lot of small private networks being formed. Um, we're seeing a lot of large public networks being formed. Um, we're seeing a lot of invitation, sort of semi-restricted membership networks being formed. We're seeing a lot in the U.S. We're seeing a lot in Western Europe. We're seeing a lot, you know, increasingly in Asia. Um, you know, we're seeing some networks have five or ten people and max out, and that's all they want, and they're perfectly happy. And we're seeing other networks that have you know two thousand, three thousand, four thousand or more uh, members. And it's just it's it's really fun because it's 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 all across the board. Oh, I'd say another thing we're seeing is we're seeing networks that are um, you know tr purely transient in nature. People will do a social network for their wedding, for example, and you know that that social network is going to basically be over the day after the wedding. But that's fine because it lasts. It's it's what. Uh, Sometimes it's been referred to as situational software or situated software. As it's you know it's going to be a social network that's going to live for six months or nine months until the wedding, and then it's no longer going to be relevant. It'll just you know it'll just go away. And we're seeing other networks that I think will be very long lived. Um, and that's part of what I think is really fun about what we're doing is you know people have you know a lot of people now have seen MySpace or Facebook and they either use it. Um, you know, or they or they thought that it wasn't quite right for them, um, and now we're giving people the opportunity to create their own social network around you know whatever different category they want, with whatever rules they want, um, and you know the creativity. One of the things we do for fun around the office is we we watch every day. We go through the list of the new networks that have been created, and it's you know at this point several hundred a day, and you know the names just from the names alone, you can see the amount of creativity that people are bringing into this and the number of ideas that people have. So. At the moment, um, it's 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 uh, it's uh, it's very exciting to watch, and you know, at the same time, it makes it really really hard to predict. Uh, you know, what'll be you know, if you ask me, what'll be the biggest social network on thing in a year? We don't have the slightest idea. Fascinating, Mark. Um, there's a sense in the educational market that uh, the current school model was built to satisfy the needs of of industry a hundred years ago. As an employer today. Can you tell me how you think students need to be prepared uh, now to enter the job market? Yeah, so we we have pretty have pretty strong strong opinions on that. Um, uh, I would start out by saying that what what I look for when I hire, and this is my third company. Um, my first company hired thirty five hundred people. My second company hired seven hundred people. This one so far we hired twenty eight, but we're here, uh, we're hiring as fast as we can. Um, we really look for, I mean, it's, it's kind of taken as a given that we're looking for smart people, but more than that, you know, we're looking for, you know, 
in particular, three attributes that I, I think are really important that not everybody has. Um, one is we're looking for drive uh, and self-motivation. So we're looking for people who are determined to make an impact. Um, two is we're looking for curiosity. And so we're looking for people who love to learn. And one of the things that we always look for you know, in the interview process is, you know, this is something that delights me when people do an interview process is when I say, you know, do you know about, you know, have you looked at, you know, I'll pick something out of the blue, you know, do you know about XML, do you know about Twitter, do you know about whatever? And they say no, which is good because they're admitting it. Um, but then they come back two days later and they're like, oh, I looked into that and I read about it and I learned about it and here's, you know, here's, you know, X, Y, Z, here are the things that I think about it. Curiosity, drive. And it's amazing how many people will not put that level of effort even into learning about new things. They just, they just don't, don't do it as a natural sort of day-by-day -day thing. So the people who do are, 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 I think, very valuable because the nature of, of what we all do, the nature of a company like, you know, companies like mine and anybody else these days is, you know, things are constantly changing. And so the ability to learn and the interest in learning is very, very important. And then I think third is, is uh, and um, probably sounds obvious, but is ethics and, um, you know, the idea of being ethical and of delivering on commitments and taking, taking commitments seriously and treating people fairly. Um, is incredibly important because you need to have, uh, it's, it's really required to have a, a strong team, which is what makes companies successful. So, you know, I think that, you know, specific knowledge, you know, given all that, if we find the right candidate walks in the door with the, with the drive, the curiosity, and the ethics, and they don't have the specific technical expertise that we need, um, or the specific experience, or they haven't worked at this kind of company before, we'll hire them in a heartbeat. And if they walk in the door and they've got a great resume, and this happens a lot, they've got a great resume, great track record, they've worked at other internet companies, and, you know, they've been in very successful places, and they're just not curious, or they just don't seem driven, um, you know, we have a really hard time hiring them, in, or they have a hard time succeeding when they come on board. So. You know, I think if I map that to education, I would say, you know, anything in, in, in the educational process that encourages people to, you know, determine their own interests, to pursue their own interests, to be able to learn, you know, learning how to learn basically being, you know, more important than anything else, being encouraged to pursue uh, areas of interest. Um, you know, if somebody, you know, I would even go so far as to say, you know, if somebody is super interested in math, then, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with spending, you know, far more time on math than on history. If there's somebody else is interested in history, then go spend all the time on history. I think it's important for people to be generalists, but it's more important for them, I think, to be, to be, to be set up psychologically um, to know that it's okay to get into the thing that they're interested in because um, that, you know, those are the people who are going to, I think, I think do really well through the driving curiosity. Mark, when you decide to hire an education director, will you send me an application? Absolutely. <laughs> you, you got it. First on the list. Hey, thanks so much for the time. Uh, Absolutely. It, it, uh, really fascinating to talk to you. Really appreciate your insight uh, here and uh, uh, really feel like you've contributed to the discussion. Great. Thanks, Thank Bob. you, Steve. Much appreciated.